All right, so we're gonna be talking about um, low back pain. All right, uh, and the reason why it's so topical is because like many of you, um, people have been sitting on the couch, people have not been working out, people have been stuck at home, and now we're on a, a modified ECQ. So we're gonna have more of the same, All right? So thought it was a topical issue for this month. Um, so here we go, All right? When we talk about low back pain, we always have to talk about the master control system of the body. And everybody who knows me should know what that master control system of the body is because I mention it all the time. It's the nervous system, right? So your nervous system controls everything that happens. So we're gonna be talking a lot about the nervous system um, over the next hour. Right? And it all starts with your brain. So your brain controls and regulates your body. And it does that by sending a signal down through your spinal column and out through your spinal nerves. You can see um, this broad branching network of nerves um, that will control and coordinate how well the body heals, how well the body functions, organ function, muscle contraction, things like that. Now your brain has a helmet, right? We call it the skull. So um, that protects the brain, but now you also need something to protect the tail of the brain, the spinal column. And from there we have our spinal column, right? Um, which looks like this. So your spinal column um, is made up of 24 bones, right? Now it has to protect that spinal cord, but it, you also have to move. So there's a, a trade-off of mobility for stability, right? So we're gonna look at the, uh, a, a unit, which would be two individual bones and a disc. So we can see over on the left, right, we have uh, a vertebrae, a disc, and a vertebrae. And you can see right in this area right here is where the spinal nerve comes out and goes to the body. So it looks like that, right? Now, when the body's functioning normally, right, and we have good motion, okay, there's plenty of room in here for the signal to get out, right? The problem happens when we have something called a subluxation. Right? Subluxation looks like this. The bone simply slips out of its normal position and now it puts pressure on the nerve because you get a lot of swelling, you get the surrounding soft tissue gets irritated and it causes pressure on the nerve and it interrupts that signal from the body to the brain. Love it. Oh, totally. uh, next. Okay, so when we have a subluxation, we get um, scar tissue, right? You get a little adhesions in the joints and it causes uh, the bones not to be able to move properly. So the bones don't move properly. We get loss of uh, signal from the receptors in the nerves up to the brain, which we'll see here, right? This is a subluxated section. It'll also put pressure on this disc right here, okay? and Studies have shown that poor posture uh, have been associated with tightness in muscle, uh, decrease in spinal joint, right? We call that a subluxation, okay? You also get hypomobility, which is an important uh, factor because your spine is a generator for your brain, right? Your spine sends signal to the brain and then upregulates the brain and then the brain in return sends a signal down. Now, once you have a spinal segment that's no longer moving properly, it slows down that feedback mechanism to the brain and then the brain just slows down, okay? So um, lastly, these adhesions lead to pain and further degeneration and breakdown of the spine. In addition, um, low back pain uh, can be created when we have a poor posture, which we're gonna see in a moment. Our posture will dictate the amount of stress in various places. Now. Your spine has three curves in it to protect against the gravitational forces. But when our posture is off, these uh, curves that are supposed to protect us, now they get flattened out and then we get um, stress where we shouldn't get stressed and the body tends to break down. So if we correct these uh, posture, we can eliminate our back pain, take pressure off of the discs, off of the nerves and off of the muscles. Okay. And there's an interesting study uh, where it showed that people with what's called the kyphotic posture, which is basically a rounding uh, of the shoulders and the upper uh, part of the back um, has like a hump on it. Okay? It, uh, it tends to actually shorten people's lives. The reason being is because, um, I mean, we can do an experiment right now. If you just rounded your shoulders and slumped forward and try to take a deep breath, 
you'll notice probably it's a little laborious. It's hard to take a deep breath and you can't really fully expand your lungs. Now, if we try and straighten the body out, bring our shoulders back and now take a brief, deep breath again, you probably notice that it's a lot easier to breathe. Right? So we get fuller oxygen into the lungs. Okay? In addition, the heart is able to beat uh, with less stress. So uh, poor posture can lead to a shortened lifespan is what the, the study found. And if that is true, then the opposite must be true. If poor posture can shorten your lifespan, then correcting that poor posture uh, could lead to uh, expanded years in your life. All right, so here are your typical uh, posture settings, right? You have what's called a sway back, which is that first one. Okay. That usually comes from people who have weak abdominals and their center of gravity, which is supposed to be right about, right behind the belly button, right? It shifts, it shifts um, forward and, or it shifts backwards, I'm sorry. And the body, you try and sway your hips out to try and equal um, the center of gravity so you're not gonna fall over. The opposite of that is what's called the lumbar lordosis. Lordosis just means ex excessive curve right in this area of the back, the lumbar spine. Okay, that can put undue pressure on the L4, L5 disc. Okay, and then this is our most common one is that kyphotic uh, posture that we talked about earlier, right? Usually we'll see this kyphotic posture with the upper back being rounded in conjunction with the forward head posture, the next one. Now people are sitting for eight, 10 hours a day on average, and their head comes forward because either they don't have their workstation set up right or they're texting or they're reading. So their normal head posture, which should like to look like this last one, the ear should sit over the shoulder. Instead, the head starts to come forward and then that center gravity again moves forward. So the body has to do something. And what it does is it rounds the upper back right here and then it'll shift forward the sway back. So you, you've got a combination of a number of these. And posture is an excellent way to tell whether you have these spinal subluxations that we talked about that put pressure on the nerve. Right. So, it's always a good idea to check your loved ones, have them check you, look from the side, right? That's glass pressure should give you an idea of what you're looking for. You want your ear to line over with the midline of the shoulder, which should line over with the hips and the mid part of the knee, as well as the outside of your ankle bone, which is called the malleolus. Now, the other big thing that, uh, that happens when we don't have proper spinal motion is called imbibition. Imbibition is how your discs get uh, nutrition. Discs don't have their own blood supply and they need nutrients in order to uh, replenish old cells and to, to live. So they do that by what's called imbibition. And that looks like this. Imbibition is when the bone above and the bone below are moving and it creates a negative pressure on the disc and it sucks in nutrients, fluids, and it pushes out metabolic waste product. Now, when the, when the bones are moving properly, everything works well, you just stay nice and healthy and they stay hydrated. When you have a subluxation and the bone moves out of its proper place, you start to get a little scar tissue, you start to get swelling around those nerves, you get loss of imbibition, and then you get one of two scenarios. And those would be either you get degeneration, okay, which we see over here on the right, and you get degeneration of a disc because again, there's no imbibition and so the disc is slowly dying. In addition to the imbibition, you'll start to get degeneration of the bones, which you'll start to see. Uh, you can see it on x-ray very easily. You'll start to see these like little lips or little pointy parts. And if anybody who's been into my office, we've gone over your x-rays. If you have arthritic changes, very easy to see. The other thing that happens is we can get disc herniation. Now disc herniation can happen from two, two main ways. You can either have a, what's called a macro trauma, which is a uh, high force trauma, like a car accident, slip or fall, or more likely you get a subluxation when the bone moves out of its proper alignment. And now you don't get e even distribution of force. If we go back to that imbibition uh, example, right? You get an even pushing down of the vertebrae above on the vertebrae below. But when we have a subluxation, we get an uneven distribution of force and these concentric rings that we see here on our, on our disc will start to tear. And they'll tear slowly. You get about 20 or 30 rings, right? And they'll slowly, slowly tear, tear, tear until one day you're bending over to pick up a, a wet towel in the bathroom and your back goes out. And all of a sudden it feels like somebody shot you in the back because you get this excruciating pain. Well, was it 
the weight of the towel? Of course not. It was just the fact that you had this subluxation for so long, even though it was asymptomatic, you didn't, you didn't even know it was there until eventually it gave out, kind of like a car tire eventually blows out. So here's what it's gonna look like on an x-ray. Okay, the first one is a normal x-ray. And as we mentioned before, you have a, what's called a lower data curve in your low back. That curve is there, kind of like a bridge to help dissipate the amount of gravitational force. That second uh, is an x-ray and third one is an MRI. So an x-ray can't show uh, soft tissue like a disc, that's what the MRI is for. But the x-ray shows us the subluxation. We can see that L4, right, if we count up from the sacrum, um, it's the second line, second red line there is not in line with the first red line and third red line. So that bone's moved out of its proper place. Now we know from that we've lost imbibition because the, bo the bone is not gonna move properly. So the disc below, we can see is dehydrated. And if we look at the um, MRI, you can see that that it looks like a shadow pushing into that uh, the, uh, the spinal canal. In addition, the one below it, if we look at the x-ray, is also not functioning very well. Uh, that's a, more of an example of a degenerative disc. And we can see bony changes, right? If we look in, uh, in the circle, you can see right on the edge there, see right here, we can see little bony changes going on and little bony change right here, all right? So these are things that are very easy to check uh, to see if it's something that's going on in your case. Now, what can this cause, right? Um, because the uh, nervous system is the master control system, it can cause almost anything. Now we're gonna stick uh, our conversation, stay with uh, the low back. So we're gonna look at what the low back can cause. And we can see that depending on where it is, we can have different problems, right? L1 usually goes to the large intestine. So we can get things like Crohn's, colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea, right? L2 goes to uh, the appendix also goes to the small intestine, right? So we can also get digestive problems there and, and goes to the upper leg. L3 is mainly for your sex organs, right? So you can get anything from um, problems with hormones for, for the ladies. Uh, we can get uh, dysmenorrhea or amenorrhea, your menstrual tr troubles. You can get uh, problems with the uterus and get a lot of miscarriages, okay? Also goes to the bladder and as well as the knees. So this is why when people come into my office, they say, hey, doc, I got knee problems, you know, and if I don't even look at their knees, they say, hey, I told you I have knee problems. Why are you looking at my back? Well, it's because the nerve that goes to the knee, we have to make sure that it's sending a good signal to the knee, right? More likely than not, it's the nerve that's the problem, not the knee, because most people have one knee. My right knee hurts, not my left. Well, both knees are the same age, so we know it's not aging, right? <laughs> it's not like uh, one knee came out of the the womb first and the other one came out a couple years later. So we look at the nerve, right? Where is the nerve able to supply the knee? Is it able to contract the muscles in a coordinated fashion? Is it able to send nutrients, you know, down the blood supply down, right? So these are the things that, that'll happen when the nerve is not uh, functioning properly. And if we look at L4, we have prostate gland, lower back muscles and sciatic nerve. Again, when we talk about where does it hurt versus what's, where's the actual problem, right? Sciatica, is pain that, that shoots down the leg. Now, nothing's wrong with the leg. The problem is the nerve, which comes from the spine. So we can take pressure off of that nerve at the L4 nerve root, and all of a sudden your leg doesn't hurt anymore. Okay? Then L5 goes to lower leg, ankles, and feet. And then uh, the sacrum, which is the base of your spine, and goes to the hips and the buttocks, and the coccyx is for uh, your rectum and your anus. All right, so how does this present? Uh, people who have subluxation can present with low back pain, obviously. But they can get tight muscles, which we're going to see when we talk about exercise, uh, why that is. You can get loss of range of motion because that individual segment has got starting to build up scar tissue and it's not moving properly. So it's not moving properly. Therefore, you lose a few, a few degrees of range of motion depending on which way it's subluxing. You get stiffness. You can get pain that, depending on where that nerve goes, either down the leg and get it in the feet, the knees. Um, and you can get problems with uh, organ function, as we just mentioned. And you get swelling, burning, and numbness. Or you may not get anything at all, right? Uh, the reason being is because less than 10% of your nerves are sensory nerves, which means they feel pain, right? The majority of your nerve is for what's called autonomic function, which is basically your organs, or for motor function, 
right, which deals with the muscles, the ligaments, um, as well as, uh, you know, how well um, they coordinate and contract with each other. So it's possible you can get a subluxation and have dysfunction and would not even know it unless it's irritating the sensory portion of that nerve, right? It's kind of like uh, if you went to a dentist and uh, dentist told you you had a cavity, but you felt fine, it's because it's not irritating the nerve, right? The, once that cavity gets down deep enough, then you'll start to feel pain. So what are our options if we have low back pain, right? Or um, if we have dysfunction? So heat and bed rest are, are usually the, the first thing a, a doctor will tell you. Um, now heat's gonna bring more blood flow to the area um, and it'll loosen up the muscles, right? And, but bed rest, it's, uh, it, you know, we're, we're meant to move. So when you're in bed, you're not moving, it's, it's really detrimental to you. Barring any kind of a serious um, you know, injury from a macro trauma, I would stay away from bed rest. Now, popular thing, especially in my country, United States, where I'm from, is uh, drugs, okay? So let's dive into drugs a little bit, okay? So the, the most popular drugs in America right now is um, uh, opioid drugs, right? Painkillers. And we can see from this graph that uh, the number of painkillers that have been produced from 1993 just to 2016 has increased dramatically, right? Um, so people are popping more of these drugs and these drugs are very dangerous. Number one, they're highly addictive and uh, people need more and more of them because they start to build a tolerance for it. And number two, they cause a lot of problems. They cause liver, liver problems, they cause stomach problems, they cause problems with nervous system. So it's, it's probably not a good idea. There's no such thing as a safe drug. Just because a medical doctor is the one prescribing it doesn't make it safe, okay? And so here's a quote from Medicare. Again, I apologize, I'm using American uh, references, but it's you know, usually um, medical community worldwide tends to have the same sort of, uh, sort of attitude towards, towards how they deal with things. And this, I, I, you would think I'm making this up, but this is actually straight out of the, uh, the Medicare guidelines. And what it says is, a treatment plan that seeks to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong uh, and enhance the quality of life or a therapy that is performed to maintain or, or prevent the deterioration of chronic condition is deemed not medically necessary. Now, to me, that it just, I, I can't even believe it when I read it, and I, I've read it many, many times. It's not medically necessary to promote health. So the medical community is not interested in your health. They're interested in controlling a symptom, and that's why we're getting this explosion of painkillers, right? You got to take this painkiller, go away. Well, you could drink a bottle of vodka, and you, your pain's going to go away. But did the vodka do anything for your health? Of course not. Matter of fact, the next day you're going to be worse because you're going to have a hangover, right? Same thing that's happening with these drugs. They're slowly killing you, and I'm not exaggerating because. We're going to show you right now how, how bad it is, right? People are, are stuck in this pain culture and think that there's a pill for everything. And they just take a pill and it'll go away and just magically you're better. Well, right, the, um, we can start to see that you know, Time Magazine, The Scientist, Newsweek, they're all starting to wake up to the problem that we're getting more and more medicated and it's causing more and more of a problem, right? People are not getting healthier. They're just getting sicker um, just without, without a, any kind of pain. Okay, so uh, the World Drug Report in 2011 um, said that the United States, which again, kind of use the United States because um, the United States spends more per capita on healthcare than any other country in the world. Uh, matter of fact, they spend about twice uh, per capita as the average uh, country. So we kind of use them as, as our gold standard to what the medical community is doing. And he said the United States consumes 75% of the world's prescription drugs, uh, despite being only 5% of the world's population. So if drugs were the answer, the United States should be the healthiest country in the world, right? Consuming 75% of the drugs, much more than any other country in the world. But are they the healthiest? Well, let's take a look, right? The World Health Organization, they rank the uh, United States 37th. Right, 37. We spend more than anybody else, but we're ranked 37 because it's a drug culture. Just uh, for our friends here uh, in Philippines, we are ranked 60th here in the Philippines. Um, so we're not doing so well here either, right? So there's got to be a better way, right? How, how can we get, stay healthy without, without drugs? 
Well, just a few more facts about drugs for you. Um, again, we'll go back to America. Is 40 people a day are dying from properly prescribed narcotics or painkillers, right? Um, that's enough uh, painkillers to prescribe every single person in America for an entire month for 24 hours a day, right? That's an immense amount of drugs. And we can see that the death rate from these opioids have now far eclipsed that of cocaine and heroin, more than four times the amount, right? Which is insane. And yet they're still being prescribed in record numbers. In fact, uh, Gary Knoll um, did a expose called Death by Medicine, I believe it was called. And he says the number one cause of death in USA today uh, is medical care and drugs. In fact, on average, 999,936 uh, people will die a year from properly prescribed drugs and uh, medical intervention. So what else do we have here? We have physical therapy, right? Now, physical therapy is excellent. The difference between what a physical therapist does and what a chiropractor does is a physical therapist um, is uh, there for soft tissue, they're musculoskeletal. So if you have soft tissue problems, like when we talk about we have a subluxation where you get inflammation and we get um, irritation of the surrounding tissues, physical therapists can prescribe uh, some heat and some uh, ultrasound or some e stim to help get rid of some of that inflammation and be well, do well for the soft tissue. But did they address the cause? Now, you always want to see what is the cause of the issue. Because if you don't know the cause, you have no chance of correcting it. Right? Steroid injections, right? Makes you feel good. You get a steroid injection, I guarantee you, it'll, you'll feel better. Right? But what is steroid injection really doing? It is dissolving proteins. So you inject the steroid, and what's happening is the scar tissue that that subluxation is built up, and now the bone's not able to move. They inject steroid, dissolves the protein, and now the, the freeze up the bone to move a little bit better. The problem with that is you're made of protein. So it's not just dissolving your scar tissue, it's dissolving your joints. So that's why they say you can't get a steroid injection um, you know, any uh, faster than when once every three to six months because you're gonna destroy your joints, okay? Uh, pain management is no solution at all. That's just trying to keep you comfortable. And then there's surgery, right? Now, I have this little graphic here. It's kind of one of my favorite little uh, little graphics to do. So this woman is sitting right now. Anybody who sat like this has known what's going to happen after about 10 or 15 minutes to her foot when she sits like this. It's going to fall asleep, right? So her foot's going to fall asleep. So should we give her surgery if her foot falls asleep? You think that that's probably not, not the best way to do things. Should we give her physical therapy or massage or give her a medication, right? These are, these are things that sound kind of insane that you would do. Right? The reason why her foot fell asleep is because she's got pressure on her nerve behind her knee. So the only thing that logically you should do is just uncross your legs and your foot will return to normal. And so that's what we're talking about here. Taking pressure off the nerve and restoring proper function. Because the alternative of doing surgery is not pretty. It looks like this, right? And when we're looking at an intervention, we got we to gotta ask a few questions. Number one, is it safe, right? Number two, is it effective? Number three, what's the cost? Recovery time? These are things that we need to take, uh, take into account. Now, uh, spinal uh, fusion has a, not a very great success rate. It's about 50%, right? Because what happens is you're fusing two segments together. Now you've lost signal going to the brain from those what's called mechanoreceptors, right? You have little um, receptors in the joints that send signal to the brain that we talked about earlier. And now suddenly you lost that because now you've got a motion segment that's not moving. In addition, you've lost range of motion to that segment. So usually the segment above it and the segment below it will increase their range of motion and you'll start to get degeneration of those segments as well. And 10, 15 years down the road, you're gonna have arthritic changes there. So we have to ask questions. Number one, again, what are the risks of the procedure, right? Uh, if you're gonna need another spinal surgery five, 10 years down the road, was it worth it? Right? What's the cost involved? Right? A lot of people um, are, get really big on, well, does my insurance cover it? And if my insurance cover it, I guess I'm not paying for it. But you, know, you really are because you have to look at time lost from work. You have to look at your productivity. You have to look at your rehab time. Right? You have to look at your, uh, your, the cost of your, um, your lifestyle. 
right? Then you want to look at what are your expected outcomes, right? We talked about loss of range of motion. What else is it proper, probable, like, right? Loss of feeling, right? Or is it nothing at all? Okay. Um, you should always ask a doctor if they can, if you can interview some of their patients to see what their outcomes were. If they're happy with it, especially patients that have five five years post post surgery. And then look at the research, right? Just do a quick, uh, instead of Google, try using Google Scholar, because Google Scholar is um, actually um, peer reviewed literature. When if you just do a Google search, you're just gonna get um, people giving you their, their opinions. And then always trying to figure out what, what are your options, right? Um, can you do physical therapy? Can you do acupuncture, massage, chiropractic? And last is the treatment, uh, is treating my symptoms or correcting the cause of the problem? Right, that's why chiropractic is so popular because we look at the cause, not, not the symptom. So we talk about back surgery outcomes, right? So there's two types of surgery. We either get um, a, a disc laminectomy or a fusion. Those are the, the two most popular ones. Now, um, disc, uh, a discectomy is they're gonna just cut out a portion of the disc that's putting pressure on the nerve and you get instant relief because you have no more pressure on the nerve. But you still have the problem that caused that disc to, to wear out and herniate. And you get a recurrence rate of about five to 25% within five years, okay? And then uh, with a spinal surgery of fusion, about 50% is successful. And that number goes way down if you need a second surgery, down to only 30% of a success rate, then 15% for a third surgery, and only down to 5% if you had a fourth surgery. Okay, so we kind of went over this one already about symptoms that we're gonna get when we have low back pain. So our symptoms, it's good to think of them like an iceberg, right? They're only the tip of what's going on, right? Because you can't feel liver function, you can't feel heart function. And so you really don't know, you can't feel degeneration of the spine, degeneration of any joints. So it's using our symptoms is really a poor indicator of how healthy we are. I mean, I, I hear it all day long in a clinic. Oh doc, I'm healthy. I guess I don't need to come in anymore. But as we see, um, our symptoms are a very uh, poor indicator of how well we're doing, right? You're either moving towards health or you're moving away from health, right? And we're never stagnant. So we're moving one direction or the other. Anybody remember these guys? It's, uh, so that's Patrick Swayze on the left and Farrah Foss on the right. So are, are they healthy, right? If you look at them, can you tell if they're healthy, right? They're both feeling good, looking good at the peak of their careers, but they're not healthy, right? Both of them, in this picture have cancer, right? The cancer is taking a while and this is where they, where they wound up, right? Patrick Swayze died of a pancreatic cancer and uh, Farrah Fawcett died of, he said, ovarian cancer, um, right? But they didn't know it for the longest time and done until it was too late. So it's a very poor indicator to base our health on how we feel. How about this guy? Is he healthy? You guys know who he is? Everyone knows who he is, right? Steve Jobs. So is he healthy in this picture? He thinks he's healthy, right? But what happens, right? He died too. Again, pancreatic cancer. He was very sick in that picture. He just didn't know it until eventually it got so bad that really there was nothing left to do except just, you know, get ready to die. So we talked about cause of death, right? Cancer being um, one of the top five. Now, one in three men will get cancer and one in two women will die of cancer, right? And it'll manifest long before you ever even know it's a problem, right? The cost, 60 billion a year spent annually, and that's just the United States alone. We talk about the number one killer in the world, heart disease, right? It kills more people than every war put together on earth, right? One in two people will die from heart attacks who have heart disease, right? Without even knowing it. Right, 80% of heart attack victims, their first symptom is death, right? First symptom. Um, There's a guy named James Gabalfini. I don't know if anybody uh, is a fan of the show Sopranos. He was walking around, thought he was healthy, right? He was a little overweight, but he thought he was fine. Died of a heart attack, right? So we can see that using uh, how we feel is a very, very poor indicator of how well uh, and healthy we are. The World Health Organization defines health as optimal function of your body mentally, physically, and socially, and spiritually, and not merely just the absence of disease. Let's try to do that. There we go, that's better. Aye. 
Okay, so health equals function, right? How well we can function. Can we climb a flight of stairs without getting winded? You know, can we go throughout our day without getting fatigued? Are we getting headaches and things like that? Okay, so back to our nerve, right? Because it's important that we understand this, right? If we are not uh, getting any kind of pressure on that sensory, that 10% portion of the sensory nerve, you will not feel any symptom, right? You may have some digestive stress. You may have maybe a muscle or two that might be tight or something like that, but you won't be feeling any kind of pain. And so you'll think you're healthy. But our nervous system is the master control system, right? It controls the function of everything we do, right? So we wanna make sure that it's functioning properly. Right? When you have a, a problem, either uh, known or unknown, right? You're gonna have what's called a stress response, right? And that stress response is gonna increase your blood pressure, right? So a lot of people taking blood pressure medications when they don't need to be. They just have to fix what the, the stress response that their body's going through, right? Your body also will increase its heart rate, right? Resting heart rate should be in the 60s. Muscle tone will increase. So all these things are designed to give you your body the best chance of survival in what's called the fight or flight state, right? You know, a tiger is coming and you have to protect yourself from this tiger, either fight it or run away. So all these symptoms that we're talking about are things that are gonna help keep you alive. Digestion stops, right? Because you don't need to worry about digesting lunch if you're gonna be lunch to the tiger. So you don't need it. So the body shunts its energy elsewhere, all right? Reproductive sex drive, same thing. You don't need to worry about having sex if you're about to get eaten by a tiger. And you re decrease your serotonin level. Serotonin is that feel-good hormone, okay? Which uh, incidentally, everyone thinks the majority of serotonin is in your brain. It's more, you get more serotonin in your gut, in your intestines, than in your brain. So if your mood is not what you want it to be, Try increasing gut health, not brain health, and it should help. Okay, you increase your sensory system and your fear and anxiety go up, right? Uh, your immune response goes up. Your insulin sensitivity down regulates, right? So it leads to things like uh, diabetes. Our blood sugar rises, so it gives instant energy. And our HDL, that good cholesterol goes down, and our bad cholesterol, that LDL goes up. Because LDL cholesterol is designed to help repair when you get um, like tears in your arteries, right? It acts like little cement to kind of uh, repair those. Incidentally, just on a side note, right? That's um, people who take a cholesterol lowering drug, it's like the worst thing you can do. Number one, because your LDLs are there for a reason. It's there to help repair the damage that's being done to your cardiovascular system. So instead of just saying, hey, I wanna lower my LDLs, you gotta say, why is my cardiovascular system being damaged that I need such, so much LDL? In addition, the majority of your brain weight is cholesterol. So if you're gonna take a cholesterol lowering drug, you, you're, gonna, you're setting yourself up for dementia. So stay away from any kind of cholesterol lowering drug, they're called statins. So back to our stress response. Our clotting factors increase. Right, to help make sure we don't bleed out if we get eaten by the tiger. So there's a basic premise for, uh, for life, and that is that all life is designed to propagate itself. Right? You're designed to be healthy to give yourself the best chance of survival. Then your body is smart, and your nervous system is that master control system. And then your spine is there to protect that, uh, the tail of the, nervous, uh, the central nervous system being the spinal cord. Right? And unfortunately, we don't live in a... Uh, the kind of lifestyle that our bodies, our DNA is designed to live in, right? We were designed to be hunter-gatherers, right? If you just think of uh, when Jesus was around, right? We have the exact same DNA that people were walking around when Jesus' time, yet we live a vastly different kind of lifestyle. So we need to do certain things to, uh, to augment that, right? We didn't used to have to brush our teeth because everybody ate natural diet. Now we have to brush our teeth, prevent cavities because there's so much sugar in our diet. Same thing, we probably didn't need to have chiropractors a long time ago because we didn't have this kind of sitting all day lifestyle that we have now. So when we talk about uh, what's gonna cause low back pain, right? There's stress, it takes three different forms, right? Either traumas through micro and macro traumas, toxins in the body, and that can be also, uh, we um, lump in there um, nutritional deficiencies, and then thought patterns, right? Our stress hormones 
um, that's gonna, like cortisol, it's gonna help uh, cause inflammation and give us uh, increased uh, response to pain. So everybody knows the, the more the, the macro trauma, right? The car accident, the slip fall, but far more uh, prevalent is something like this, right? This uh, should probably ring a bell to a few of you. Uh, is this sitting like this, eight hours a day at work and going home, sitting on the couch, watching TV, driving in a car. We're sitting far, far too long and it's putting much, much, too much stress on our spine. And then we get these changes. And now we're gonna get changes on our entire spine. Your neck's gonna lose its curve. We're just gonna cause that upper back to round like we saw that kyphosis we talked about. And then we're gonna lose that lumbar curve because our body's gonna have to compensate and that's when we're gonna get some low back pain. Right? So we call these macro tra uh, micro traumas, sorry, micro traumas because they're small little traumas that are, be that are done over and over and over again. Okay? When we talk about sitting as a new smoking, right? Um, they said the average person sits between eight and 10, uh, uh, was it, you know, 10 to 12 hours in a day, right? Eight hours at work and then another two hours while we're sitting eating food and then we're sitting watching TV and, and uh, you know, reading a book or something like that. So, um, we already went over the subluxation is a uh, joint misalignment, right? That's uh, putting pressure on the nerve because the soft tissue gets damaged and it causes inflammation and irritation, right? You get muscle spasm because um, you have these individual muscles, which we're gonna see in a little bit, that are supposed to stabilize the joint. They dysfunction when you get a subluxation. So you get these larger muscles that are trying to stabilize the joint and they have to spasm because they're not one joint muscles, they're multi-joint muscles. We get a loss of inhibition, which is that disc pumping that we talked about, and we get a joint fixation. Okay, so we're gonna have to address pretty much all of these when we talk about um, back pain. Okay? We have to realign the joint. We have to look at the soft tissue damage that's been done and provide good quality nutrition to help anti-inflammatory. Things like omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. Now, omega-3 fatty acids are gonna take 18 days before it builds up in your system. So be patient when you take uh, omega-3s. Um, but especially when we talk about now with COVID, right? Uh, COVID, one of the big problems is it causes inflammation, especially in the lungs. So if you have adequate amount of omega-3 fatty acids in your body, if God forbid you do get COVID, it'll be much, much more minor because your body will not go into an inflammatory state. We also wanna stay away from pro-inflammatory things like red meats or trans fats, right? Trans fats are not healthy, right? They're the opposite of the omega-3 um, fatty acids. So we want to also um, look at rehabbing the muscle, which we're going to discuss in, in a few minutes. Okay, and then we need to do specific exercises to re rehydrate those discs and go from there. Okay, so um, this is the stress response, which we're not going to go over it again. Hopefully you, you guys got it. <laughs> um, but this is all the stuff that's gonna happen every time you get a subluxation, or anytime you get any kind of stress on the body. Your body doesn't make a distinction between any kind of stress, whether it's physical stress, whether it's chemical stress, or mental emotional stress. Even if it's perceived, even if it's not real, you can imagine a tiger attacking you. Your body's gonna give the same stress response as if a tiger is actually coming to attack you, all right? So we have to kind of keep an eye on these things, right? The one thing that everybody can do is try and figure out a way to uh, decrease the mental emotional stress, right? Um, we've talked about in other uh, seminars about something called emotional freedom technique, which is a way to decrease that fight or flight response to a stimulus, right? There's something else called anchoring. And if uh, anybody wants help with that, just drop me an email. My email is gonna be at the end and I'll be happy to send you some information on this stuff. All right, so how do you know if you have a subluxation? Well, the first thing we wanna look at is our posture, right? So get a friend, look in the mirror and look from front view if you're eyes are straight or if one is higher than the other, look to your shoulders, is one of them higher than the other there. And you wanna put your hands on the top of your hips, right? That's called the iliac crest, uh, the top of that bone right there and see if your hands are the same height, right? In addition, look at your feet. Is one foot turned out more than the other? Right? These are gonna give us indications on where these muscles are tight and where the uh, spinal subluxation may be. We're also gonna look at uh, x-ray. Okay, because that's really the definitive way to, to see exactly how much damage is going on and the exact position of the bones that's out of place. And then we're looking at, uh, you know, palpation, right, which is just feeling uh, proper motion, either static or motion. 
Okay, so there's three things that we want to do, right? There's some stuff we want to stop doing, stuff we want to maybe slow down doing, and stuff that we want to start doing. So we're going to start with the stop doing, if, uh, if that's, that's a proper way to say that, right? Um, so we're going to stop doing these bad habits. And the first one being texting, right? Um, people, when they text, usually their head is in a forward head posture. And you look at the x-ray on the right, you can see that when the head's in a forward head posture, we lose, we lose that curve that's in the neck. And that curve that's in the neck is designed for a couple of things. Number one, it's designed to keep the, the head dissipating the amount of force that's pushing down. But in addition, it, uh, it provides adequate space for your spinal cord. Because when we bend the head forward, it stretches the spinal cord, which slows down the signal from brain to body. Uh, in addition, if we look at the, the slide, you can see that um, as the head comes forward, the weight of the head is exponential. So now your muscles have to hold your head up, right? You're conditioning your brain to change the anatomy and you're, ha you're conditioning the muscles to have to do the, the work of holding the head up when it should be your skeleton. So how do we want to text? Now, instead of looking down to text the phone, just bring your elbows into your side and, and bring the phone up um, to about chest height. That should be adequate enough for you to keep your head in a somewhat of a neutral posture. All right, that's probably the biggest thing you can do. And if you know anybody with kids, try and get them into this habit because we see it more and more with children that they're losing that curve in their neck. We used to only see it when I started uh, practicing. It was only, you know, in, in people that were in their 40s and 50s that were getting what's called a reverse curve in the neck. Now we're seeing it in younger, younger population because people are spending so much time on a screen. So um, when we talk about low back, right, it's, um, this is an important concept to know. When we lose that low, that curve in that low back with that lordotic curve, and we can see that first uh, model right there is in a forward flex position or a flattened back. You can see how the disc gets bulged to the back of that model, and that's where that nerve comes out. So we don't want to be in that position because you're going to be constantly putting too much pressure on the back portion of uh, the of the disc. And that's a weakened portion of the disc. The front portion has a ligament in front of it that prevents it, right, uh, from bulging out there. And not to mention there's, not a, there's no nerves there that's really gonna be irritated. But that back portion, especially the back, uh, the back lateral side, the back sides of it, there's no ligament there, so it's a weakened state. And if we stay in this flex position or flattened back, you're gonna be causing the rings of that disc that we saw earlier to start to fray and you're gonna herniate that disc. So here's some do's and don'ts, all right? We're gonna, people usually, when they get out of bed, for example, they, have, they go from a, a supine or a back lying position, they try and sit up. And that's a very detrimental to your back because number one, you're using what's called your hip flexors. Your hip flexors are connected to your entire lumbar spine as well as your disc. So when they contract, they start to pull on those. Now you've been sleep for eight hours, your body's cold, and your body needs a little bit of time to warm up before you can get motion and you're getting a lot of stress on there. So we don't want to get up like that. If we look at the bottom three slides, it's a better way to get up. You roll to your side, tuck your knees up towards your, towards your belly, right? Then, then you're going to put your hand down uh, on the, the upside hand. Gets, you're going to push down and the downside hand pushes up the elbow as you bring your legs off the bed. So you're going to create kind of like a, like a fulcrum, right? The weight of the leg is going to pull you down and then you're going to push your hands up and you're going to kind of seesaw up. Okay, when we look at things like bending over to bend our shoes, right? We look at this first view. Go back to that model, right? He's bent forward. Where is that disc? It's bulging to the back. Doing that over and over and over again is going to cause damage, damage, damage till one day his back's going to give out on him. So we want to use things, uh, techniques where we keep our back nice and flat. The woman on the right has perfect form, right? She just brings her, the leg that's on the ground is back further from the, uh, from the table. Okay, same thing when we're bending over to uh, pick something out of a, a dresser or something like that. We wanna make sure we keep a nice flat back. Far too often people are just, they, they're bending over at the hip, right? Very, very bad for your low back when you bend at the hip because again, go back to that model. Where is the disc? The disc is bulging out to the back and eventually it's gonna pop. Same thing for a work, right? Take a knee, keep the back straight and look that way as opposed to just bending over, right? Um, the problem is that people have, there's no consequence to bending over a few times, right? So it's kind of like, um, oh, I'll just have a hamburger, 
or something. You know, there's no immediate consequence. So we don't, it doesn't kind of uh, stick to our mind that, that, it, that this is detrimental to our health. It's not until years later that we get some kind of problem. I mean, look at smoking, right? If you, if you have a cigarette right now, you're not going to get lung cancer. So smokers really don't think they're going to get lung cancer because they say, ah, I've been smoking for a while. My grandma smoked all her life. But it's the constant habitual uh, you know, um, routine that gets you into trouble. So when we're picking things up, keep our back flat, lift with our legs, right? So people, you've probably heard this many, many times, but keep the center of gravity close to the body, right? If, uh, if, if stuff is out too far from the body, it's gonna shift the center of gravity forward and that's gonna put too much strain in the back. So keep it in close and lift with the legs, okay? Bending over, you're gonna do what's called a hip hinge, right? If you look at the, the first uh, slide on the top, right? Again, she's in a bad position for her low back. The hip hinge would be the, the one right below it where you drop one leg back while you bend forward. Her hip, her, uh, so she's bending at the hip and not so much rounding the back and it's pro uh, protective. Putting on socks, you can lean against the wall. And we're gonna talk uh, probably a little bit uh, more expanded on sitting because right, we're sitting all day long. We're sitting at computers, we're sitting at home. So we wanna make sure we're sitting properly. And we can see the one on top again we've lost that lumbar curve and we're getting uh, the bulge in the disc to the back. So when we're talking about, let's talk about workstation, right? Because we wanna set up our workstation a certain way, right? Um, you wanna see, does your feet rest flat, flat on the floor, right? If you're only on the tippy toes of your floor, it's gonna to create too much strain, right? Are your knees bent approximately 90 degrees, right? If the chair is too low, it's gonna create um, you know, too much of a, an acute angle in the hips and it's gonna tighten your hip flexors. Okay, does your chair support your low back? You should have a lumbar support in your low back um, to help keep that curve and protect, protect your back with the gravitational forces. Okay, is there about two to three inches uh, from the front of the seat pan to the back of your knees? You wanna have enough clearance so that you, uh, you're not restricting blood flow or nerve flow. Can you easily reach the, uh, uh, your work without uh, having to reach, right? Because once you start reaching, you start rounding your shoulders, the head starts coming forward, you start to break down those three, uh, those three curves in the spine. Are your arms able to, uh, to relax without interference from the armrest? The armrest should be um, a little bit lower than where your elbow is, okay? If it's too high, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna shrug your shoulders and it's gonna shorten your traps and give you, give you pain. Are your shoulders relaxed and not elevated when you're working on your keyboard, right? Your elbow should be bent 90 degrees with the hands straight out in front of you, which we'll have a graphic in a moment. Okay. Are your arms resting at your sides rather than stretched out in front of you? Okay, can you reach your mouse without rotating uh, your arm outward or reaching to your side? Okay. Is the keyboard approximately elbow level, right? Which we just talked about. Um, with your fore, uh, forearms level and flat. Okay. When you type, are your wrists in line with your forearms and not bent upwards or to the side, which will aggravate or cause carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay. Top of your computer screen should be at eye level, okay, so that we're not getting that forward head posture, the rounded shoulders, and that flattened low back. And you see detail comfortably uh, on your screen without leaning forward. So this is a, another important point. Usually people who are, are um, desk workers, um, those are the people who have back pain more than anybody else. And one of the things we also look at is eye strain. If you're constantly looking at this computer screen, you should take just five second break every 15 minutes or so. Look out the window just to get a, a different uh, focal point for your eyes so that the lenses aren't stuck in one position uh, for too long uh, and damaging your eyes. Are you able to read the entire screen comfortably without tilting the head up or down? Okay, uh, do you have an adjustable document holder? Uh, for reference material, again, to keep your head in a nice neutral position. Um, if you spend more than an hour a day uh, combining computer work and phone work, do you have a headset? We're almost done on these. <laughs> Are all your input devices at the same level as your keyboard? Uh, if you use an adding machine, is it close uh, and easy to reach? Are your keyboard monitor located uh, in center line in front of you? I think it's the last one. And do you take short, frequent breaks throughout the day to reduce eye fatigue and regular fatigue? And are you uh, comfortable and free of pain while working? So here's what it's supposed to look like, right? Put all that stuff together and we just went over, right? A computer monitor uh, is about eye level at the top of the monitor. Your elbow's bent at 90 degrees. Your 
uh, wrists are not flexed or bent. We have a little bit of gap between the knees and the seat. We have a 90 degree uh, hip angle, feet flat on the floor, and we have a lumbar support. So um, one good strategy, right? If we're sitting too long, it's still, even in the best of conditions, not good for you. So you can create a, you can have a desk that uh, either will change level, like a, a standing desk that has a little hydraulic and you can stand up. If that's too much and your boss isn't gonna pay for that, you can get uh, that second slide on the right, um, kind of a workstation that has a, an arm on it that can lift up and down. Or uh, other two options are just change your chair, right? Uh, the bottom left is a stability disc which you can sit on. Now, I wouldn't recommend sitting on it all the time at first because um, you're actually doing some core work while you're on it. So it can be, it can get fatiguing. So just start 10 minutes for an hour. Ten, every hour for 10 minutes you go on it, right? It's gonna cause you to keep your pelvis in a neutral state and keep your lumbar spine um, in uh, a curve. And then there's an exercise ball, which will do the same thing. We wanna engage our core to help protect our low back. All right, we talked about both feet on the floor, right? If they can't reach the floor and you can't change the, uh, the chair, just get a little book or something and, and use that for your, for your rest, okay? Um, or document folder. Okay. And then the other thing is uh, the mouse. If you use an external mouse, right? Yeah, people don't even really think about it, but you're getting little micro contractions thousands of times a day. That builds up over time and it'll start to create um, with the trapezius muscle, which is a muscle that connects from your head down to your shoulder. It'll start to create uh, little adhesions in there and what's called trigger points. And you'll get like these real sore spots in there and you'll start to uh, pull your spine out of alignment. So if you can try and switch the mouse every other day, um, in the beginning, it's a little bit of a, a, a hassle because you're not used to using either your non-dominant hand uh, to use the mouse, but it's gonna, it's gonna help you in the long run, not only for um, balancing your muscles, but it's also gonna help your brain because your brain has to learn a new task and your brain loves novel tasks. When it learns new tasks, it has to think, it has to rewire itself and it stays young and fresh. Okay, uh, if your job just uh, requires you sitting long periods of time, you should get up and move every uh, about five minutes per hour. Um, and I've created a, uh, it's somewhere in here, you'll see. I created something called a desk exercise. So anybody who wants it, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to send it to you. You just keep it by your desk and like five minutes, it takes four to five minutes to do, uh, out of the hour, just stop and you're gonna do a few, few stretches, stretches that are uh, prone uh, for people who sit uh, for long periods of time. And just, it's gonna make you more productive because when I first tell people this, they're like, well, I don't even have five minutes, I'm so, so busy. But what happens is you get what's called presenteeism, whereas you're sitting there in front of your desk, but you're not as productive as you could be because your brain slowly uh, stops functioning to its peak capacity because you're not getting enough blood flow to it. You're not getting enough nerve flow to the brain and the brain shuts down. So here's my desk exercise, right? So we're gonna focus on a few things, right? Your neck, bring it back in a neutral position because more, more times than not, the head comes forward when we're sitting at a desk and looking at a monitor or reading materials, things like that. We're gonna stretch those traps that, uh, that the mouse can get. And that's that young lady, uh, second one on the left. <clears throat> we're gonna stretch our forearms from, uh, from typing, okay? Because those get tight and prevent carpal tunnel. We're gonna open up the chest to prevent rounding shoulders and get that kyphotic uh, posture change that we're hopefully we're gonna avoid. We're gonna do diaphragmatic breathing, which is gonna engage what's called your transverse abdominis, which we're gonna go into in a moment when we get to the exercise portion. And we're gonna stretch your hamstrings. So total time to do this, four to five minutes. Okay, so here is muscles that we wanna keep an eye on, right? When we talk about low back pain, you have, these are the muscles that are the primary cause of your low back pain, all right? Um, and that is because they're called the multifidus muscle. And what they are is they're spinal stabilizer muscles that cross one joint and one joint only, right? So when you get a subluxation and bone, the bone gets popped out of place, you're gonna get atrophy or you're gonna get uh, malformation or malfunction of that multifidus and your body's not gonna stabilize that segment. Which we can see the bottom right, that uh, second from the bottom is that muscle is not functioning properly. So what's gonna happen? You're gonna have to have these big muscles, right? The one on the left uh, is called your quadratus lumborum and the one on the right is called your erector spinae. 
those two muscles are, they're multi-joint muscles. Now when those little um, uh, multifidus muscle cannot stabilize a joint, these two muscles have to take over. Now they can't just stabilize one joint, so they spasm because they have to try and lock down the, the whole spine so that subluxation doesn't get even worse out of place. And that's when you start to getting back pain. So what we wanna do is try and rehab those multifidus muscle. Right? And we're gonna show you how to do that in a minute. In addition, that muscle in the middle is called your transverse abdominis, right? It acts like a belt. You can even look at it. It kind of looks like a belt that goes around. So it's gonna help protect your core. And that's another muscle that we're gonna train, okay? So we train the multifidus and we train uh, the transverse abdominis, and that'll give you a nice stable core to help protect the low back from uh, being out of place, okay? So our first exercise we're gonna do is um, a, it's, it's a modified crunch, right? A crunch, primarily does what's called your rectus abdominis, which is that six pack that everybody has. But we're more concerned with your transverse abdominis. So when we're doing this, we wanna try and flatten the back a little bit and then lift the shoulders off the, off the ground, okay? So you don't wanna allow your head to move forward, right, during the movement. And so it's just gonna be a, a slight contraction off the floor. You're also gonna try and bring your belly button into your spine, right? Try and kind of make your midsection a little skinnier, which is gonna contract your transverse abdominis. Okay, next is gonna be, um, again, for your transverse abdominis, what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and engage these pelvic floor muscles. They're called Kegels, right? The best way to describe a Kegel is if you were having to pee, right? If you were at the toilet and you had to pee and halfway through your stream, you had to stop your pee, you would contract those pelvic floor muscles. When you contract your pelvic floor muscles, your transverse abdominis also contracts. So you wanna put your hands on those, uh, on the transverse abdominis, which are on the side, right? The rectus abdominis in the middle, the transverse abdominis on each side. You just look, they're right above your hips, uh, like that bone on your, your pelvis. You put your hands on either side, do that Kegel exercise, and try and feel a contraction there. It takes about a week or two to get proficient at doing this, but once you do, you'll, you'll be able to feel that your uh, transverse abdominis is kind of forming a brace around your body and protecting you. Our next exercise, is um, a modified side plank, okay? This is gonna uh, be helping with uh, engaging those multifidus muscles to stabilize, okay? Starting position is hips on the ground and just lift it up and you're gonna hold it there for a few seconds and bring it back, okay? You wanna do about 10 repetitions, okay? You're gonna, don't do the exercise every day, every other day is fine. The only exercise you can do every day is the transverse abdominis, the one where you use your Kegel exercise, Kegel muscle. And then next we have um, what's called bird dog, okay? Again, designed for the multifidus muscle and uh, the uh, low back stabilizers. So low back stabilizers are not mover muscles. So they don't move anything, they just stabilize. So we're not moving the low back. In fact, we're trying to keep the low back as still as possible. So when we do this exercise, we lift. You can start with just one, uh, one limb, either arm or leg. When that gets too easy, use opposite arm, opposite leg. When that gets too easy, extend opposite arm, opposite leg, and make like uh, make make boxes, like and just draw a box with your hand and draw a box with your foot, right? Always designed uh, to keep your pelvis in a neutral position. Don't let your pelvis open up, number one, and don't let your your body kind of twist. Uh, you want it because our goal here is to use our stabilizer muscles to stabilize it while we're adding an external force. And I have to mention this because it's so popular, right? People get sciatica all the time, which usually comes from an L4 uh, nerve root, right? But they get pain down the leg, right? So um, when people get sciatica, oftentimes they're gonna have a, a tight, what's called piriformis muscle. Now, if you can see my cursor, that piriformis muscle attaches here to here, and it gets tight and inflamed, and it starts to push down on that nerve right in here. So we wanna stretch this muscle out, um, which will give us an, uh, a little bit of more space in there for that, um, take pressure off the sciatic nerve. And the way we do that, cross one leg over the other and then just grab the back of um, the leg that we're not stretching and pull it up towards your chest and you should feel a stretch in um, the, the buttock of the leg that's crossed. Okay, you hold that for 20, 30 seconds and return uh, to neutral position and then do the other side. So, that brings us right, right about an hour, not bad, to the end of our presentation. So I have a gift for anybody that 
actually is still watching. I don't have you guys on my screen, so I don't know if I'm just talking to myself or if there's people actually still on this call. But if you're on this call and you found this stuff helpful, number one, I would say, if you could leave me a like, if you're part of my Facebook community on, uh, on my Facebook page, so that more people can start to um, get exposed to holistic healthcare and stay off drugs and, and surgeries. Number two, um, I have worked it out with my company that anybody that wants to come in, if you make an appointment tomorrow, we will knock 30% off the exam price and we'll also give you a special rate if you decide to move forward uh, with care in our office. Now, what does care consist of, right? Uh, at least for me, care is gonna consist of uh, making sure that you don't have any spinal subluxations, adjusting your spine, um, giving you and monitoring um, a more in-depth uh, exercise rehabilitation program. You saw just pieces of it here. We couldn't go in, in depth because it's so varied depending on what's going on in your case. We'll also talk nutrition, right? On how to remove and uh, control inflammation, which is a big part of the pain process. Okay, and then we'll discuss uh, other things like uh, the mental emotional process of uh, keeping you healthy. All right, so my email is sitting there right at the top. If you want to take advantage of that, drop me an email and I will make sure I get you in um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as we can. All right, we are now, we're open during, uh, during this COVID uh, quarantine, whatever it's called, MECQ, but we're still gonna be open because people need uh, to get their immune systems boosted and that's what we do, okay? Uh, so, any questions? Oops, all right, I didn't mean to do that. Any questions at all? I don't know if anybody's muted, is anybody even still on the call? Uh, I guess you guys can shoot me a, an IM maybe, if you have any questions. Uh, Asians never have questions. Love you guys, but you guys never have any questions. White people never shut up, but Asians are like, uh, you never hear a peep. So I'll wait another minute or two to see if anybody has any questions. If you have questions and you either don't want to share it in the group or whatever, again, my email is, is, is right there. Uh, jot it down. You can drop me an email and I'm happy to spend uh, as much time as you want answering any questions you have. Preferably no questions about the Kardashians, but keep them health related. And, uh, and I'll be able to help guide you through uh, whatever you need. All right. And again, if you found this helpful, please leave a like on my Facebook page because I'm going to be doing more talks. We're going to, I decided uh, the next two talks should be on the two, uh, two biggest killers in the world, heart disease and diabetes. So probably September we'll do heart disease and then um, October we'll do diabetes. So look for those. Um, again, be, uh, be part of my Facebook community so you'll keep updated and you'll, you'll know what's going on because I usually drop out um, little nuggets of, uh, of wisdom in my Facebook page. I'm starting to get a little bit more active on Instagram, but that's kind of for young people and I'm, I'm not so young. <laughs> All right, um, that's about it. Thanks for sticking with me, everybody. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this and got some, uh, some value at it. And I will see you in the uh, next the next webinar hopefully and uh oh if you have any comments also right this is only my third third one doing this uh, on zoom usually i do it in front of a live audience so um drop me notes right either you're speaking too fast we don't understand your accent the mic wasn't good blah 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 whatever you got right because i'm always want to improve uh how i deliver this material all right thank you everybody and uh have a good night and i will see you again soon bye thank you doc all right, take care.